Advisory Organ Scientific Panel will begin shortly. In the meanwhile, allow us to introduce the Sensory Organs Warm-Up, a short segment where we introduce and welcome our chairman through a couple of questions. To preside over this session, we introduce you to Professor Miguel Castel Branco. He is a professor at the University of Coimbra and the coordinator of Instituto Biomedic de Investigação da Luz e Imagem, as well as the director of Instituto de Ciências Nucleares Aplicadas à Saúde. His work focuses on brain neuroimmunology and its relationship to human vision. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Miguel Castelo Branco and the Sensory Organs Panel Coordinator, Ana Inácio. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Miguel Castelo Branco, and it will be a pleasure for me to share this panel presentation on the senses. I am myself a visual researcher. I study the retina. Here you can see nice pictures of photoreceptors from living human retinas. I also study the visual brain and do structure function correlation using imaging techniques, such as MRI. Here you can see nice pictures of the visual maps in the brain. We also study visual perception, and I wonder whether you can see any face on this screen, but if you can't, please contact me after this panel. Let's now go to the speakers. The first speaker will be Robert Rassam. He will talk about ossicular reconstruction, the magic of middle ear surgery. Robert is one of the world's most experienced middle ear surgeons and will give a talk on his developments in the field of osseculoplasty. Anthony Cavaja will talk about big data and AI. Anthony is an expert in artificial intelligence and ophthalmology. He is at Morfield's Eye Hospital, London, and is one of the world's rising stars in ophthalmology. Finally, Jamie Ward will talk about synesthesia, from cognitive abilities to clinical vulnerabilities, the fascinating experience of crosstalk across the senses. Jamie Ward is one of the leading researchers in the field of synesthesia, for example, the sensation of a particular taste when hearing a word. We very much look forward now hearing your talks. Robert Vincent is an ears, nose and throat surgeon at the Coast Ear Clinic in Columbia Ears, France and an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. His work focuses primarily on stape surgery and ossicular reconstruction of the middle ear. In fact, Dr. Vincent has designed several middle ear prostheses and published new techniques in ossicular reconstruction. Today, he'll be presenting the lecture, Ossicular Reconstruction, How I Do It. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Robert Vincent. Hello, it's a tremendous pleasure to me, for me to be part of this uh, great event. And, and again, I would like to, to thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be part of this. Um, I was very impressed by the presentation of neuroscience before, so I'm only a surgeon compared to what I've seen before. And the plan uh, today, the aim of my presentation would be to uh, show exactly how techniques of uh, middle ear reconstruction are. So I would talk about ossicular reconstruction. As you notice in, in the presentation, I'm mainly a state surgeon and ossicular reconstruction surgeon, but I will focus on specifically ossicular reconstruction and, and not talking about stapes and otosclerosis. Uh, so let's see what we can do. So I'm going to do the next slide, which is I push on the green button. So it works. Just a few slides to show the Coast Ear Clinic, which is well known in the south of France since more than 60 years, mainly dedicated to ear surgery. That's in the south. So it's not so far from Lisbon, but on the, on the other side of the Spanish uh, border. So we need to cross the Mediterranean side. Um, so we were going to start now with this is the place and where the where we are um, in, uh, close to uh, Montpellier and to the Spanish border. 
So when we talk about ossicular reconstruction, you can see that there are so many uh, different types of presentation perioperatively, and the type of construction, but also the, the, the hearing outcomes, will definitely depend on the situation, on the anatomical conditions, because the results might not be the same if you are missing only one ossicle compared to when you are missing all ossicles. You can understand that easily. So I will try to show the different techniques according to surgical presentation. And I must say that uh, ossicular plasty for me is, is, a great, uh, is a great surgery. I like it very much, uh, including, of course, tapis, which I'm not going to talk about today specifically, but also congenital malformation where you have to fight against nature. And so it's very uh, interesting, a lot of fun uh, to try to improve the hearing. Uh, post-operatively. So we learn from failure, that's it, and I learn myself from my own failures, uh, despite the fact sometimes the French surgeon that do not accept to have any failure or recognize. So let's talk about the different presentation, the situation. The first one would be uh, absence of uh, incus. In this uh, drawing you can see the incus is eroded and you have only the malice and the is intact. So gonna, of course the aim would be to put a prosthesis or ossicular uh, trimming be, be between the malice and the stapes in order to rebuild uh, the conduction, to, re to, to re rebuild the conduction between the malice sandal or the tympanic membrane and the stapes head. And you will see that I changed the technique. Uh, this is what we call a PORP, partial ossicular reconstruction prosthesis. But I prefer to use a TORP, which is a total ossicular reconstruction prosthesis, which I use despite the presence of the stapedal arch. You can see on the left, that's the otoscopic view. Uh, you've got a, a left ear with a perforation and an eroded incus. So that's definitely the type of reconstruction we do. And I'm going to show you different aspects. This is uh, perioperatively at the beginning of the operation. You can see that we have a pore which seems to be fine. But when I revise, this is a revision operation following a previous failure. And you can see that this partial prosthesis seems to be fine and well positioned on top of the head of the stapes. But we have what we call a tilting effect, which means that there's a lack of energy. Just before I continue, just to remind you, we have two types of prosthesis, PORPS and TORPS. PORPS mean partial ossicular reconstruction prosthesis, that's the one and TORP, total ossicular re replacement prosthesis, means uh, total ossicular re replacement prosthesis, and it's usually used when you don't have any more stapes, but I've changed this uh, status, as you, can, as you will see. That's another condition where post-operatively there was a failure, because again, the PORP, as you can see, was, til was tilting, and there was not a great efficiency in the ossicular reconstruction, so I had to change that and put another prosthesis between the malice and the stapes head, as you will see. So that I, I, I prefer to use that type of reconstruction. This is a torp. And the point is that the torp is positioned here underneath the malice sandal. You can see the head is, is white. And this is hydroxylapatite with a, a groove, which is drilled out, which is made the center of the prosthesis head. And the, the prosthesis head is, it is placed usually underneath the malice sandal. And you see the torp is attached, the shaft of the torp is attached to the stapes with a piece of, of elastic band, and you will see that in more details in a second. So that is going to be a, a, a reconstruction of a right ear. So I'm doing, all you're going to see is a transcanal approach. When we talk about surgical approach, in ear surgery we have, let's say, three types of approach. But if, if we make it simple, we have one which is transcanal approach, which, which means that the entire surgery is performed via the external auditory canal. That's what I'm doing. And we also have a posterior approach, which is made with a posterior incision, which is mainly used in case of, of uh, chronic otitis with cholesteatoma. But that is a transcanal view and transcanal approach. What I'm doing here, I'm separating the incus from the stapes and I'm checking manually malleus incus, and you can see that it's fixed, which means that in this case, we have a normal stapes, the stapes is mobile, but, but the malice is fixed. So what I'm doing here, I'm dissecting the malice. So you see, we, we're using, of course, micro instruments. I'm doing an incision through the malice, 
It's an incision through the periosteum of the malleus, and I'm separating entirely the malleus from the tympanic membrane. This is going to be what I call the malleus relocation technique. That is a technique that I designed and introduced and published in the main journal, which is ontology and ontology journal. Um, I'm checking now the tympanic membrane, which is fine. I'm removing now the incus. And now I'm going to cut what we call the tensor tympani tendon. And you see we have a gap between the anterior malleus and the stapes heads. I'm going to reduce the gap by overstretching the anterior tympanic malleus ligament. The aim is to change a little bit the anatomy of the middle ear by placing the malleus over the stapes head. So there's no more angulation, there's no more gap between the, the malleus and the stapes. So now it's becoming more easy, of course, to place a prosthesis. Uh, there are many types of different types of prosthesis, but the one I use is made with uh, hydroxylapatite head, uh, because if you use hydroxylapatite, which is close to the, uh, to the ossicle, we don't need to interpose any cartilage. Now I'm measuring the distance between the malice and the stapes foot plate, because of course I'm going to cut the process at the corresponding length, and I'm checking the stapes mobility, which is fine. So this is definitely the process I designed with a company called Grace Medical. So you see I cut the shaft through the, the prosthesis head and I will pull the prosthesis back, I will pull the, the, the shaft back in order to get a 6.5 or 7 millimeter neck prosthesis in this case. And you see this band which is going to be used to attach the prosthesis to the stapes. So the distal tip of the shoe is placed on, to, on the stapes foot plate and I will now introduce the malleus within the groove like this and then I will attach the prosthesis to the stapes with the band. So we could leave it like this, of course, but by using the band, I will increase the chance of prosthesis stability. When we do uh, obstacle reconstruction, we have to fight again prosthesis uh, risk of um, this, uh, dislocation of the prosthesis. This is why we need to find the best way of stabilizing the prosthesis. And of course, by placing this band around the stapes, you can increase the long-term stability of, the, of this process. And when I published my results um, in several series, I compared uh, my results uh, between using that, that, type, that type of technique and TORP compared to PORPS, because in the past, of course, before introducing this new technique, I was uh, using PORPS. And by doing a prospective study, I was able to, to show definitely that statistically there was a great difference between TORPS and PORPS. And this is the way I moved to the use of this technique of uh, malice relocation and cellastic bending. Now let's go to the second type of presentation, which means absence of stapes and incus. Like in this case, we only have a malice, but a stapes full plate is there with an, an erosion of the stapes superstructure, as you can see. But the stapes uh, full plate is mobile. So in that case, I will use the fact that the, the plate is mobile. We'll put a prosthesis like you're going to see now uh, between the malleus and the stapes foot plate. But you can imagine, of course, that uh, the uh, chance of stability is a little bit lower than before, because when we don't have a stapes, there's no possibility to attach the prosthesis, the, the shaft of the prosthesis. So we have to put the prosthesis like this, and we try to finalize the stability, but it's not so, uh, so, so sure. Uh, the, uh, this, is, this is what we call the group B, and in that case, definitely I will use a torque which will be positioned between the malleus and the stapes foot plate. On the, on the left, you can see a retraction. It's not a perforation, it's a retraction of the tympanic membrane with a total erosion of the ossicular chain. Now, let's typically go transcanal approach. This is a left ear again. What you can see here is the eroded incus that you can see on the right and the stapes foot plate. There's no residual stapes superstructure. So I'm going to place now the, the, the process as you can see. I'm going to check now the mobility of the stapes foot plate with a 0.7 millimeter diameter sucker. So it's a very small instrument. I'm checking the mobility of the stapes foot plate. And again, I'm going to do the same as before, uh, separating the incus, uh, sorry, the malleus from the tympanic membrane and trying to uh, to, make, to, to have a completely free malleus sandal, entirely separated from the tympanic membrane. Many surgeons don't do that, they just put the process directly underneath the tympanic membrane, but I believe that by using the malleus, 
we are increasing the chance of stability because we have at least one point of stability, which is the maricentro. So again, I'm cutting one tendon, which is called the, the, the uh, tensor tamponite tendon, and again, overstretching the anterior ligament. The aim again, and that's the second point, stability is also followed by, uh, you, you have a better stability if you have a, a vertical position of the prosthesis at the end. Now again, I'm placing the same type of prosthesis introduced within the middle ear cleft, uh, the distal tip of the shaft on, on the stapes full plate, and then the malleus sandal within the groove. But of course, there's no stapes here, so there's no way to, to use the synastic pen. So you see it's not so uh, sure to get a procedure. What is necessary here is to find a final vertical position of the procedure like we have here. And by uh, checking the, the procedure, you can see it the full eye. No, it's, it's just a, a nice way of showing you. Now, the, the, the other case would be Mali sinkers are both absent. And we well, we have only here uh, stapes, which is uh, intact and mobile. So in that case, definitely I will use a torp. In, in, in the past, I was using a torp, which was positioned directly from the tympanic membrane to the stapes head like this. But again, as you notice, I change uh, with the use of a torp. Uh, this is what we call group C. It, we have different types of uh, classification. We need classification, of course, when you talk about of ossicular traction because there are so many different types of presentation that it's important to compare apple to apple. So when we compare our results between different teams, different series in the world, we need to know exactly what we are talking about and we cannot compare results when the state is, is there compared to when the state is, is fixed or absent, as you can imagine. So we, we use this type of classification, which is called Austin cartouche, but there are other types. So that's a, a, a nice case of congenital malformation. This is again a transcanal approach. It's a young child having absence of uh, only a, a residual state is absence of malignant, which are completely malformed. And you can see, you can see on the left the facial nerve. I didn't explain that, but um, it's important to identify the facial nerve, which is in the middle of, of course, the middle cleft. What I'm doing here, I'm drilling out uh, the prosthesis head. The point is that when we do little. The shape of the middle ear is very narrow, so we have to adapt uh, to the anatomical condition and I have to change and reduce the size of the prosthesis head. This is also what well, I like to use the hydroslaptite material compared to titanium because, of course, titanium cannot be shaped like this. And you see, uh, here I try to place the band around the stapes head and again finding the what is cut here is the stapes tendon, which is cut, as you can see. And the band is placed underneath the stapes tendon, always in this technique, because of course the tendon will avoid lateralization of the band. So it's it very narrow. This The size of the speculum, which is always used for transcanal approach, was less than uh, five millimeter here. So you can see it's really narrow. Now let's go for um, uh, case uh, number four now, which will be stapes fixation, which is completely different uh, uh, situation. Uh, and it, it, when we talk about chronic otitis, I'm not talking about um, otosclerosis. This can happen when we do revision stapes operation for otosclerosis. But I'm talking about chronic otitis here, so it's definitely more related to tympanosclerotic stapes fixation, like you see in the drawing. So in that case, what we have to do definitely is to perform what we call the stapes daughter which means a fenestra of the stapes foot plate, 0.8 millimeter diameter stapedotomy, fenestra, covered with the vein graft. The technique of vein graft in deposition uh, following stapedotomy has been designed by uh, the Costier Clinic team in the past, um, also John Che in, in the US for stapedotomy. But the evolution was there, and the aim is to, by using a vein graft, uh, which is stick over the stapedotomy is to avoid any fluid leakage to protect uh, the ear again, any fistula. So that's definitely the group F. Uh, and in the past, you, you have to understand that, like you can see on the left, we have a huge tympanosclerotic plaque of the tympanic membrane. And in the past, it was considered as contraindicated to do stapedotomy in case of tympanosclerosis, like in this case, you can see. We have uh, the malice there over the stapes, and you can see all is white, and the way this is made is related to tympanosclerosis. So what I'm going to do here, 
I'm going to use the laser. I didn't show you that before because it was not a stay piece fixation, but we use a, a, a laser with a handheld piece. I use many types of different types of laser. The one I'm using now is a CO2 laser because CO2 is very safe for the inner user. But I'm using uh, a handheld probe and not a micro manipulator, which means with the handheld probe, I can definitely touch the target and be very accurate and very safe for the, for the fashioner. Fashioner is here on the left and uh, on the fallopian canal. And I'm now drilling out with a 0.7 millimeter diameter diamond dust burr, drilling out the foot plate to flatten the foot plate and then to perform at the end a 0.8 millimeter diameter uh, stapedotomy. And uh, at that stage, it would be important to cover it with a vein graft because you're going to use a torp, which will be positioned from the malleus to the stapedotomy. Now you can see the flute coming up. I've got two hands here using two hands. On my left hand, I'm using a 0.7 millimeter diameter sucker. And on my right hand, the diamond dust burr. And the problem here is that we need to avoid sucking into the labyrinth. Otherwise, there is a risk of sensory or hearing loss. Now, I'm measuring now the distance from the state dotomy to the tympanic membrane at the malisandal. And that is the vein which has been taken from the dorsal face of the hand. The vein is then introduced within the middle ear cleft and, 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 and sticked to the foot plate. And now you see another type of torque, which I also designed with the Grace Medical Team again, with a Teflon shaft. The shaft is 0.4 millimeter in diameter. But again, the prosthesis head is also made in Adoxab. So the shaft, as you can see, is introduced within the stapedotomy, and then the malice handle will be introduced within the prosthesis groove, like this. Again, to find a final vertical condition. And you, you can see here on the right moving something, which is what we call the round window with a round window membrane. This is a test we always do to be sure that the, uh, the, uh, it works in fine with the uh, uh, reconstruction to the inner ear. Now the last condition the, uh, could, be the, the, could be the worst one when all ossicles are absent, uh, a total missing ossicular chain. We have to rebuild the entire ossicular chain, like in this case where you can see there is absence of malice, abs absence of incus, and, and only a mobile foot plane. It's even worse when you have a mobile when you have a fixed foot plane. But in that case, the problem is to try to understand how to stabilize the reconstruction, whatever you use, and and in case I introduced the technique of uh, creating of the creation of this new design uh, malice, which is called the malice replacement prosthesis, because if you don't have anything to hold the prosthesis, the chance of stability is very low. And literature in the literature, if you look to the different series and the the, the, big, the important group in the world, uh, in case of absence of ossicular chain, the uh, um, success rate post-operatively is less than 25-30%, which is pretty low. But I got this idea of rebuilding the malice and recreating a malice handle with the malice replacement prosthesis, which is made in titanium, as you will see, to rebuild the new malice. And then there will be two prosthesis at the same time, of course, uh, torque will be also inserted in, into the middle ear cleft. So that's the group, what we call the group D, with or without stapes fixation. Uh, and you can see on the right, this is the malice replacement prosthesis plus the torque. So the aim is just to rebuild the malice handle, as you will see. So that, that, that prosthesis was really nice. I think it's, there is a Y shape, and because of the Y shape, as you will see, this, this gives a uh, very nice flexibility of this process. So you have, we have to perform to drill out two holes through the bony canal wall. This is the right here. So this is, uh, you can see at, at 12 o'clock and two holes using a 0.6 millimeter diamond dust burr. And you see the body sandal now, which is made in titanium. And I can, uh, I can insert a torque underneath like this. And we need to cover that with uh, a cartilage, as you will see. This is the left ear. And definitely, you can see the fascia nerve on the right, the white uh, um, uh, bridge that you can see. And I'm checking now the uh, stapes foot plate mobility of the other window. And this is the prosthesis. So I'm drilling out now at 12 o'clock, the first hole. And then I, I need to drill out the second one corresponding to the second hook. You notice that this prosthesis has two hooks. Uh, and the point is to get a stability, of course, of this prosthesis, but also because we have a Y shape. 
this is more flexible and this is this will help to get a better chance of the efficiency um, also the flexibility of this process is very nice so we can adapt the position to any most of the situation sometimes we put if we have any more bone on the right, then I will put this mileage process on the left and you can see that now we definitely increase the chance of stability rather than having nothing to horses is, which could be placed directly only underneath the tympanic membrane. That, so that was the point by introducing this technique of uh, mileage uh, relocation. And uh, I don't want to talk about my results because I need to do that on 20 minutes. So I hope you enjoyed it and this is my contact uh, email and I'll be happy to receive you in the cost clinic if you want to see any live surgery you can you are definitely welcome to the clinic so you can join me by using these two uh, emails thanks very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it I'll be ready for the panel later on Thank you so much Thank for your so lecture, much for Professor, your lecture, as well as for well your amazing for videos amazing you brought to us today. To us we now today. have time for some, questions. Have time for some questions. To begin with, to begin um, with is the, um, the prosthetic material specially designed by your team? And do you use a 3D printing, printing to make them? Make them? No, in fact, these prosthesis, I just got the idea. I, I get the idea of the prosthesis, but the prosthesis itself is made by a company. We cannot do it otherwise. It, it needs to have a, a FDA uh, approval. It needs to have also the, uh, uh, the NHS approval in, in, in France and also in C, C Mark in Europe. So, I mean, it's, it's impossible. So, we work with companies to do that. And they use 3D, I guess, probably. Patients yes. you currently face it's whilst really performing these minimally invasive well. surgeries. Say it again. I didn't get the, the beginning of your question. Uh, what are the main complications you currently face whilst performing these minimally invasive surgeries? It's, yeah, I think it's a great, uh, it's a good question. And it's a great term. This is definitely a minimally invasive surgery because we only do a transcanal approach. So there is a very small incision in the ear canal. We can also use a, a endoscopic surgery, but it doesn't change the thing because it's the same approach. So the complication, there are different types of complication, but the most severe one would be, I would say, the risk of sensory or hearing loss with the risk of uh, bone conduction, which means the inner ear dropping down uh, with impossibility for us to improve that. The risk is very low in case it, it most frequently present in case of stapes fixation, but it, even in that case is now less than 1%. So in my hands, in my experience, when I published my old results, uh, which is closed up now in stapes surgery for 7,000 cases, it's 0.5%. And the other one would be uh, facial uh, palsy, but I didn't have any, but that's another one possibility, of course. Up of these patients. Say it again. It, um, is auditory rehabilitation included in the follow up of these patients? These patients? Yes. I, you know, I have a database which I designed and I took, put all my patients uh, prospectively and I followed them prospectively over years. Uh, so I'm definitely uh, an old man now because I went in 1991 uh, starting my uh, experience and all my patients are there in, in, included in my uh, database. So we have hearing uh, audiometry before using uh, audiometry with all frequencies air conduction and bone conduction and each time i see my patient and as a follow-up enter both clinical um, things but also audiometry using all frequencies thank you uh, the next question is what is the most crucial step of these procedures um the most crucial i think it's more related to the work at the at the level of the state peaceful play and specifically when we have to perform uh, state on me because of course that, that is the, the, the well the risk of having complication is so when you approach the state peaceful play it's pretty uh, tricky uh, specifically because it's very narrow we have something like a three millimeter length up to 1.5 millimeter wide so i mean it's very narrow and we have to perform a very small fenestra so i would say that's the most tricky part of the technique uh, what has changed in ocicular reconstruction surgery since you started started until now I think the most important thing we changed that was the related of the uh, type of prosthesis which was used uh, with uh, the evolution of different materials, titanium, hydroxylapatite, etc. 
But also there's a new step coming up now, which is the use of a middle ear implant and bone and carry hearing aid, but that's another discussion. Uh, but that could be used also in, 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 in parallel to this type of techniques when there is a medical contraindication, for example. That's the main evolution. Thank you. We no longer thank have you. more questions, so thank you so much for your participation in the IMED conference.